You're listening to Two Smart Assets with Chris Thompson and Danny Nichols. This is your source for passive investing in real estate syndications. It's time for us to gain knowledge and take action. So let's go. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. This is the Two Smart Assets podcast. I am your host, Danny Nichols, here once again with my co-host, Chris Thompson. What's going on, Danny? Good to see you, man. Good to see you, too. You know, we had another great guest on this week. Tell the listeners what we're talking about today. Okay, so today we talked to Travis Watts. Uh, Travis is a full-time passive investor, and he's a director of investor relations at Ashcroft Capital. Uh, we talked a lot about his transition from long hours at his W-2 job to being able to create an abundance of time through passive investing and then being able to take that time and give back uh, in the form of educating others when it comes to apartment syndications. He has some great, uh, got some great insights and he's got a great point of view. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, he provided a lot of good stuff on this episode, so can't wait to jump into that. But first, we just want to give a shout out to all our listeners. We really appreciate you tuning in. And if you haven't done so already, please make sure to subscribe to the show and leave us a rating and written review. It really helps us grow the podcast, attract more guests, and ultimately provide better information for everyone listening. And if you're a passive investor or looking to get into passive investing, then head over to our website at twosmartassets.com. There you can grab our guide for passive investing and apartment syndications. It's just a great introduction in the world of passive investing and apartment syndications. So make sure to check that out. Also, grab our apartment syndication sample deal. This is going to help you get comfortable with looking at these types of investments. So when the real opportunities come your way, you'll be ready. And if you have any questions about what's in either of these resources, drop us a line anytime on our website's contact us page, or you can message us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. We're posting some great content on there, so make sure to follow us and start connecting. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's jump into the show. Hey, everybody. Today's guest is Travis Watts. Travis is a full-time passive investor. He's been investing in real estate since 2009 in multifamily, single family, and vacation rentals. Travis is also the director of investor relations at Ashcroft Capital. He dedicates his time to educating others who are looking to be more hands-off in real estate. Travis, good to see you, man. Welcome to the show. Hey, Danny. Hey, Chris. Happy to be here. We're excited to have you here. Yeah, we're definitely excited to ha have you here. You know, we know uh, a little bit about you. I've heard you on some uh, other podcasts and stuff like that and know about some of the stuff you're doing on social media. But let's just take a step back. Let's just dive into your story. Tell us a little bit about that and how you got started in real estate. Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, we need to call this episode Three Guys from Tulsa. That's my personal right. pick. Or Perfect. at least three smart assets. You guys choose. Them. <laughs> okay. I like them both. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't care. But uh, either way, I, I was born in Tulsa. Uh, we'll start there when, you know, up to four years old. Came into Colorado and got into real estate in 2009. I'll just skip right to that. I had nothing happen in between. And uh, yeah, man, got started like a lot of people do. Single family homes, fix and flips, buy and holds, vacation rentals. You pointed that out. Um, here, here's the point. I'm just going to bullet point it like this. I, I worked in the oil field, 14 hour days, 98 hour work weeks away from home, out of state, overseas. I, I was busy. I was career focused. Meanwhile, trying to scale up a real estate portfolio the only way I knew how, which was single family homes. That's the, my, my whole network was that. I had a few family members that had taken that approach. I had no mentor, coach, program, training, books, nothing. And, uh, you know, I quite frankly, I just burned myself out. So I did that for five or six years, lived very frugally, kind of followed some of this, uh, in today's terms, fire movement strategy, uh, you know, had a good income, lived very frugally, invested the difference. And, you know, by 2015, I was maxed out and I had to find a way to be in real estate, which I loved. I love the tax benefits. I love the leverage. I love just touch, feel, see. I mean, it's a tangible asset, you know, uh, but, but I did not love the business of real estate. A, because I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> I was going through the motions, but you know, as I'm doing a flip, there's people around me doing it better with better margins, finding better deals, all that kind of stuff. And, and not just one or two, but like pretty much everybody doing it better than me. And I just had a lot of self-reflection, you know, I had to kind of like let the ego go, get a little bit humble and just say, look, man, maybe this isn't right for me. Um, but maybe real estate is, but maybe what I'm doing specifically is not that strategy. So I started passive uh, investing in 2015, private placements, apartment syndications, you know, you name it, publicly traded REITs, uh, hard money loans, uh, all this kind of stuff. And um, 
today, you know, it's freed up a lot of my time, which has been a beautiful thing. Kind of gives a little bit of flexibility over lifestyle and travel and things that my wife and I love to do. And I'm passionate about helping the folks where, where I kind of was back then, the, the career focused individuals, the doctors, the dentist, the lawyer, the attorney, the athlete, the business owner, that you know, they, they really shouldn't necessarily take their eye off the ball from what's making them their money or what they're passionate about or what their purpose is or what they went to school for. But hey, we all gotta you know, invest in, in some form or fashion. And maybe there's something besides the stock market out there. And so that's kind of been my, my story, my discovery, and, and kind of what my mission is to, to help people discover the hands-off side of uh, real estate. Yeah, and we found very quickly, like you said, that we weren't doing a good job at this either. You know, it was, it was just, we weren't uh, um, basically achieving at a high level like some of these other people we were seeing doing it. So, and I think it's interesting, you know, you, had, you have um, different experience in a single family and a multifamily. So, you've done both and I'm sure you've learned quite a bit from both of these different, you know, asset types. Um, so tell us a little bit about some of the lessons you learned in dealing with a uh, single family, you know, and then multifamily and, you know, the pros and cons of those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm not here to, to, to bash either one, right? They both have pros and cons, as you point out. Sure. Uh, the, the pros on, on the active side are, you know, really starts with a little self-reflection, right? Like what, what are your skill sets and strengths? What do you enjoy? A lot of folks out there, have a unique skill set, have the time to go dedicate to real estate, you know, and, and that's their thing. And, and it's a, a handyman or a handy woman, or, you know, they have all these connections to, to raise capital and put together their own deals. That is all perfectly fine and great. Recognize that it's a big time commitment, you know, and for those thinking that, hey, I want to be a passive investor, I'm just going to have 50 single family homes one day. Well, that, that was me. And I'm here to tell you that that's just not true. You're not going to be a passive investor if that's what you're going to do. Even with property managers, even buying up portfolios and outsourcing this, that, and the other, a lot of things that are still active components to a business model that way. So uh, again, it's just kind of deciding what is your uh, what do you want your focus to be, you know, whether that's your, your career, your practice, you know, or for my wife and I, we love uh, to be adventurous. We love travel and, and flying and we, we move every few years. We're, we're crazy. And, uh, but we love it. And for us, uh, you know, having a bunch of hands-on things happening all the time. I got to be at closing over here. I got to run and get this rent check over there. The sprinkler's broken here. Doesn't allow us to live that lifestyle. And so that, that didn't, come until we got real clear on our goals, our objectives, our mission, and, and deciding, you know, what was right for us. So, so that's kind of the, the, the pros and cons. When, when you're a passive investor, you're relinquishing control. You're betting on a team of people to execute a business plan where either A, you don't have time to do it yourself, or maybe B, you think they're going to do it better than you could potentially uh, so that's kind of the trade-off, right? The, the yin and yang. And on the flip side, yeah, I made some incredible money on the active side and it took some incredible amount of time that I didn't have. And ultimately that led me to burnout. So as much as that was cool and great, it wasn't sustainable. So those are kind of some things to think about whether, you know, and you don't have to be extreme. I'm an extremist. I was all, pa all active, now I'm all passive. Hey, most people are in the middle of the road, right? Few passive deals, a few active, whatever. So it's just kind of deciding and balancing what's right for you. You know, I think we hit on uh, like basically knowing yourself and like getting that, that internal clarity. We, we talk about that like virtually every single show, you know, you got to awesome. line out your objectives and like, so really I couldn't agree with you more. And once you decide, then immediately you can start building your pathway towards where you actually want to be. And identification is like the first step, I think. So awesome. Yeah, you bet. Agreed. So yeah, so, you know, we, like Chris said, we talk a lot about, about you know, um, knowing who you are and, and those type of things. And, you know, we learned early on that uh, you really got to, you know, know about setting goals, uh, you know, going, understanding your risk tolerance and how, you know, the importance of knowing what type of investor you are. So can you speak on why it's so important to know, like, yourself as an investor, like who you are as an investor? Why is that so important? Yeah, well, you're gonna you're gonna waste a lot of time like I did, and you're gonna find yourself in things. You're thinking, "What the hell am I doing?" I was doing when I'm a fix and flip. It wasn't even my first, believe it or not. It was like I think my second. I didn't even own an electric drill. Can you believe that? I'm doing a fix and flip, hands on. I don't own an electric drill. 
obviously red flag, right? Not the right thing for me to be doing. Why was I even doing that? Couldn't tell you. And you know, the margin I got out of it, I probably would have been better renting it out for like two years and just selling it and not doing a damn thing to the property. So it's, uh, it's, so why is it important? Well, everybody, whether active, passive, whatever, uh, should first embrace the education side of it. Uh, I did a little bit. I had read some, you know, Robert Kiyosaki books and whatever, opened my mind a little bit, uh, but I didn't do enough, you know, and back in 2015, when I made this big transition, I guess we could back up to 2009, there really wasn't a lot of, you know, podcasts and, and these seminars and these conferences and these real estate meetup groups that, like there are today. Um, so today there's like no excuse. It's like, man, you've got endless resources surrounding you, you know, a thousand outlets to go learn this stuff for free. So do it. You know, we're past the information age. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's out there. Um, so, you know, and that gets you kind of the foundation. You need to kind of build the story for yourself, the reasoning, the rationale, the why for why real estate, why investing, why passive income, why equity. You got to understand that. Why save on taxes? you know, why give away all your money in taxes? Like just these things, right, can come from these books, resources, podcasts. Then you decide, okay, that makes sense. Uh, I, I wanna move forward now. Now you've gotta start balancing out the, uh, you know, the practical side of this, right? You have to take your first step. You have to toe dip into it and you don't have to go as hardcore as I did. You could just do one rental and then see how it goes for a year or one syndication deal or whatever. But it, it is finding that equilibrium and that balance because man, 2015, when I was like so burned out on, on the single family stuff, I, I said to myself in January, I said, I'm reading a book a week. That's 52 books a year. I'm going to do it. I'm executing on it. And, and man, I did it. But I tell you, that was kind of dumb. And uh, because it's like, you know, here's the fire hose, you know, and by December, I'm thinking, wow, that was incredible, except, uh, you know, what did I retain out of that? What was the practical takeaway? What's the lesson? What do I do? And, you know, I hadn't been taking action um, nearly enough. So I wish I would have read like four books, right? <laughs> Studied them hard, gone deep, and then, you know, had the practical application to it. So. Uh, that, that's why it's important to me and why I advocate for self-education books and podcasts. You know, I, I think you make some uh, incredible points. Um, you know, once you have kind of like identified your, yourself, like your, your personality traits in terms of like what you want to get out of investing and uh, the quality of life that you're looking for. Um, we also talk a lot about like risk tolerance. Yeah. And I, I was curious, like what kind of, techniques uh do you use that you might be able to help like some pointers uh for someone else you know trying to identify their risk tolerance yeah yeah it's a great point and it's hugely important too again self-reflection knowing yourself the last thing you want to do is get into this illiquid investment for five years and then realize wow that's really risky and i wish i could just get my money back and you can't or invest in you know some is speculative stock and then it goes down 50% overnight and you're kind of hosed at that point. Um, so yeah, I, again, I mean, there's, there's plenty of books and, and conferences and, and things like that. But at the end of the day, what I did was I said, okay, look, if I'm going to pivot, I have my, ra my reasons and my rationale built for single family initially, why I like that asset class, why it was right for me. I had kind of made that make sense, but I had to rewire and redesign that. And I said, okay, here's the deal. I love real estate and I know why. That's the, that's the big macro level. Now, if I'm going to be investing if pretty much 100% of my portfolio in something, and going all in with it, I better be smart about this. And I want to be investing in something that's going to be here in five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. This is a long-term play. There's a lot of time commitment and energy on my behalf. So I can't be chasing the shiny object. I can't be going all in with Bitcoin, lose my money, go all in with this over here, lose my money. You know, all these, these things that, that we get, um, you know, sold on or what have you marketed. So I did back testing. I said, okay, I knew what happened to real estate in the recession, right? I got started in 2009. Things were still actually going down then. So I saw it firsthand happening. Then I got in, it went down further. I, I was aware of that situation. What I wasn't aware of was how multifamily held up. 
how did self storage hold up? How did mobile home parks hold up? I had to go a little further out of my, my little bubble and I had to start expanding on, on this stuff. And that is what gave me the confidence to move forward, to say, okay, I like value add, fixer upper, 1980s, 90s, early 2000s product, B class properties, these particular states for these particular reasons. And I just kind of went high macro level, but I did a lot of research. And, and more importantly, I found uh, mentors. I found people that were 10, 15, 20 years beyond where I was at, and obviously still <laughs> where I'm at. And, uh, and I talked to them. What happened to your portfolio in the recession? How did it hold up? What about the cash flow? What about the equity? I ask a lot of a lot of questions, and it is that whole process gave me uh, the confidence to to feel like you know I could identify my risk tolerance through this. And and believe it or not, I'm fairly conservative. I like these stabilized deals that have long track records and history of performing. I don't do a lot of the speculative stuff. I have a portion of my portfolio that's sort of the the, the, the Bitcoin or whatever, you know, the experimental, I do all kinds of things, man. I've hit home runs and I've lost a ton of money. <laughs> so, you know, I keep that capped, but um, yeah, that's kind of how I approach it. Yeah, that's great. So you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, you found a, a you know, through all this and you kind of understanding who you are as an investor and, and looking at different markets and, you know, how they performed uh, different asset types. And you mentioned, uh, you know, having a coach, and, you know, we often hear that having a mentor or coach can really help accelerate someone's progress. Um, and as you know, there are a lot of coaches out there and um, some can be quite expensive. What's your opinion on the idea of a mentorship and a coaching program? What should, you know, obviously there's two sides to it. It's not just a one way street, but what does that look like in terms of a, a good mentor or a good coach in your yeah. mind? Yeah, the way I define it, a coach or a mentor could literally be in many, many forms. A lot of people think, oh, I have to hire a coach or I have to join this program. It, it could be anybody. It could be a family member. It could be a book. It could be an author. You know, it could be a YouTube uh, creator. <laughs> you know, right. it's anybody who's teaching you anything. That's a mentor or a coach. So I kind of use that term loosely uh, because I have a ton of mentors and coaches. But again, in all forms, the most effective have been folks that I could find a way to add value to them equally. So we could have an ongoing relationship and communication without, <clears throat> excuse me, without me having to pay uh for that you know and there's not a right or wrong it, it depends on you again it's a little self-awareness some people learn the best by attending a conference and immersing themselves in the environment with a bunch of people around that's the only way they can focus and pay attention and, and gain this knowledge other people say why would i pay a thousand dollars for a conference a book is 10 bucks or you know sometimes free maybe i'll just read the book you know right. i'll just skip the whole hassle and the hotel and the flight <laughs> And that's cool. Some people like audio books, some people like physical books, some people like Kindle books, some people like podcasts. It doesn't matter. Find out what, what works for you. How do you learn best? And it's absolutely critical. Um, and, and, and the interaction is what made the difference for me. A book is great, but at the end, I'm always left with like 10 questions. Oh, yeah. Well, well I, I get it, but what about my circumstance? What about this situation? What about this book was written 20 years ago? What about COVID? Yeah. So it's nice to have like an in-person individual to speak with and walk through those things. But um, so there's paid and unpaid. If it's unpaid, try to add value. Um, I had a guy a few months ago reach out and said, hey, man, I'm willing to run your Instagram for you if you'll teach me how to house hack and then maybe even do like a vacation rental. And so we had a nice little trade off. He didn't have to pay anything for it. I didn't have to pay anything to run my Instagram. And there you go. So it works. It's a good deal right there. That's a, that's, that's not bad at all. So it's yeah, pretty clever. Yeah. So you mentioned, so we're talking about mentors and, you know, resources. Some people, you know, might be better just taking a book and, you know, running with that or a podcast and they, you know, absorb information better that way. Um, are there any sort of resources, whether it be a book or a podcast or whatever that you found really beneficial in, in, you know, in your investing journey coming up or something that you would recommend to our listeners maybe? The thing I love about podcasts is that you can seek out what it is you're trying to learn at that time. You know, so if I have a, if I want to learn what, uh, what a real estate professional means in the eyes of the IRS, because I don't have a good grasp of that. I can go search that out and probably find, you know, 50 podcast episodes talking about it. You know, that's, that's the cool thing about it. Um, the other thing is I love online forums and I love to just mm -hmm. post questions, you know, and, and get different points of view and perspectives, you know, bigger pockets or something like that. Um, so those have been really good resources uh, for me. But again, just to reiterate, 
the best that I've come across has been an in-person mentor, somebody who's actually doing successfully what I want to do, and then me being able to somehow add value in some way, and then have that exchange and, and talk through it. To me personally, that's the best. That doesn't mean it's right for you or anybody listening. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, those are some great points. And I, I couldn't agree more on that. Um, kind of want to transition a little bit. So we know, uh, you know, you're 100% in on passive investing and multifamily uh, at this point. So everybody has a different journey, you know, along that path. So tell us some of maybe some of the mistakes you've, you've had along the way. And then some of like maybe the triumphs or su- successes you've had um, with the passive investing in the multifamily. Yeah, so I approach it. There's there's three factors to think about when you're being when you're a passive investor, right? There there's the team and the sponsorship. You know, there's the the market that you're going to be investing in, and then there's the deal itself. So think of it just in simplicity sake that way. The mistake that I made when I got started was that hierarchy right there uh, was flipped upside down. So I started saying, oh, let me look at these deals. I don't care who you are, what your team is, but, but show me the deal. Show me the money, right? And so I'm, I'm getting caught up in analysis paralysis. And I'm, finding, I'm trying to find the deal with the highest numbers. And uh, then, then I did a couple of those deals, unfortunately. And so what it taught me was, thank God we bought a good asset at a good price in a good market because, man, to no help of the sponsorship team, they could not execute the business plan whatsoever. It was a five to seven year hold. We're 12 months in. They're talking about selling. Why? Because they don't know what they're doing. That's the truth. And, you know, thankfully, we, can, we, we come out in a, in a profit situation. But, hey, good time in the market, a lot of luck. And we bought, like I said, good price, good market. So uh, to me nowadays, it's, it's all about your due diligence and your question asking and, and aligning your philosophy with the people, the sponsorship team, the GPs, at track record, of course, experience. How many times have they done this? Is this what they specialize in doing? You know, broker relationships, connections, references. And there's a lot to it. You know, I mean, we could talk all day on this, but, uh, but basically, it's aligning yourself and your interest with a partnership that's going to work. You want to like to work with these individuals, and you want to reasonably expect that they can actually execute the business plan that you're looking at. That's most important. Number two is still the market to me. That still kind of hangs in the middle because, hey, even a, even a great deal in the middle of nowhere, you know, is in the middle of nowhere. And uh, it can, if it's got a problem, you know, good luck, you know, filling it up in, in terms of occupancy. And then the last is the deal. And, and that's so crazy for so many people to think about that. Yes, the deal is important. I'm not trying to downplay that a deal itself is not important. But it's the last thing I I bet out. It's literally the last thing. I'm already probably 80% decided by the time I get to the deal. You know, I'm already decided that, oh, that group has a new offering. I'm probably in. And then, okay, show me the numbers. Yep, numbers make sense. Okay, that's how it goes. That's my methodology. Yeah, that's that's perfect. And we, we totally agree. I think when we first started looking at it, we had the understanding of, you know, we're going to focus on the deal because we got to look, make sure this thing works, you know, and uh, just kind of focus on that. But like you said, we had it flip backwards and uh, the importance of, you know, vetting that sponsor is, is critical. Can't, I know you kind of touched on a little bit, but uh, for somebody who's like brand new in this, can you kind of like walk through um, how they should begin to vet a sponsor, you know, kind of what, what that looks like, obviously, you know, background experience, stuff like that, but what are some other tips that they can take away? The biggest thing is when I sat down and actually, we talked about this in a different aspect just a few minutes ago, is about self-awareness and your own strengths and things like that. But it, when I sat down after making those first few investments that were kind of eh, in, in the passive space, I thought, okay, th- th- this is a bit foolish. I can't you know, keep doing this. I, I gotta, you know, what am I doing wrong? Again, mentors, coaches, education, books, okay. Now find out that criteria is is quite important. So I sat down and I clearly defined criteria. And this was not a five minute exercise. This was probably a two week exercise. Not that I worked on it all day, every day, but I mean, it it took time. I had to keep sleeping on it and coming back to it. But I identified, this is where the value add B class, you know, 200 to 600 unit, Texas, Florida, this, that, and the other. This is where that stuff came from. That took some research, some time, some networking, and then, I came up with that. This was probably, I don't know, 2016, give or take. And this is where, uh, for the first time, I aligned with a sponsorship team, which happened to be Ashcroft Capital, who I now do investor relations work with. And 
they checked all the boxes. This was the first group that I knew I was aligned with. How did I know? Because I had criteria defined and I had check boxes and it was every single thing I wrote down. Literally, it was crazy. It was like one of those like meant to be weird moments. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not into that kind of stuff, but it, that's how it worked. And uh, so, you know, over time, you know, I did 10 deals uh, with them. I'm, you know, I'm still in those deals. But hey, they're, they're one tool in the shed. There's a lot of great groups and I've invested with 14 plus operators out there. But a lot changed when I changed uh, to, to build out my criteria to get very clear on that. And so I would say that's number one. Now, beyond that, I mean, it's so opinionated. There's a lot of different approaches. I'm not saying one's right, one's wrong. Get a, get a book, you know, like, like Joe Fairless's book, the best ever apartment syndication books, like 400 and some pages. And it goes through how to vet deals and, and markets and criteria and all that kind of stuff. Additionally, I have a free PDF I can give away. I'll, I guess I can do that at the end or whatever you put it in the show notes. And it's, it's a quick snapshot of that type of stuff, um, you know, on, on how to actually walk through that process. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot. And I know that that, that book that you mentioned uh, uh, from Joe Fairless, we've read that book uh, a number of times. We've, we've plumbed more than that thing out. You know, we're going to have to get a new copy apart. before the pages start falling apart. Uh, but yeah, totally agree. That's uh, some great stuff there. And, uh, you know, about betting the sponsor, um, you know, and I could probably talk about this all day with you, Travis, for sure. But, uh, you know, uh, before we run out of time, we want to make sure that we shine a spotlight on you. So tell us just what you have going on. You know, here, here's the deal. I, uh, I was at a meeting with, with Joe Fairless not too long ago, and he's talking about how <clears throat> this is just like a team meeting. He says, we have to have enough of something to you know, go beyond what we really need to be able to adequately give that back. You know? So you could relate that to money, more money than what you need, and then you can give back money. For me, it's time. That's been my thing. I went from having like zero spare time where I couldn't vacation, I couldn't date, I couldn't take time off, I couldn't do anything, uh, to now I've created, because I'm a full-time passive, I have an abundance of time on my hands, which is fantastic, but I give that time back. So what I have going on is a no sales pitch, no upsell, no BS, 15 minute Q&A calls that I do. I do these all week long. I try to do them all year. Obviously, I take trips and things. But, um, you know, so it's 15 minutes, whether you, you want to talk about this podcast, anything that, you know, may pertain to you or things that you didn't understand, blog posts, video content, anything that I put out there in the world. Um, I talk to 18 year olds <laughs> doing doing house hacks. I, I talked to 70 year olds that said, hey, someone told me this word syndication the other day. What the hell does that mean? And, and, and I have all the conversations in between and I love it. And I love networking. And I love helping people. So that's what that's what I give away is my time. And uh, I mentioned that PDF, which is uh, it's called understanding real estate private placements, which is very specifically uh, what I do. And uh, it's, it's how to vet operators and deals, questions to ask, industry terminology. There's so much to it. It's packed into 20 pages tight. Uh, you can get both of these. You can sign up on my calendar. You can get that PDF download at uh, ashcroftcapital.com forward slash connect with Travis. And I'd be happy to help anybody in any way that I can. I think it's pretty awesome the way you've uh, decided to give back your your way of giving back is giving back your time. I think that's uh, extremely powerful. And, and I'm sure you give a, a huge amount of value to the people that uh, end up connecting with you. And I, I think it's I think it's awesome. Uh, I, I love teaching people. I love talking to people. And so I appreciate that in you. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, we'll make sure, uh, definitely make sure to include all that stuff in the show notes. And also we'd say that if anybody uh, is on social media, make sure to follow what you're doing on there because you're putting out some great stuff, man. And uh, like Chris said, we really appreciate that for sure. So we encourage everybody to check that out uh, and visit your website and connect with you for sure. But um, so Travis, man, it was great having you on the show. We really appreciate talk, uh, you taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. All right, no problem. All right, that's all we have for today. So to our listeners, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode. Head over to iTunes to subscribe to the show. And while you're there, we really appreciate you leaving a rating and written review. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, connect with us on social media or through our website at twosmartassets.com. We look forward to speaking to each and every one of you. Talk to you soon.